All right. So there in Deuteronomy chapter 8, the uh, verses that I want to focus on, just to kind of point your attention to, starting right there at verse number 10. It says, When thou hast eaten and art full, when thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee, beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest, when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You know, so with that emphasis tonight, the sermon that I'm going to be preaching is called Beware Lest Thou Forget. Beware lest thou forget. This whole chapter is about, you know, Moses obviously preaching by the Spirit of the Lord about not forgetting the Lord, not forgetting, you know, the things that he had done for them and the things that he had commanded them to do. You know, because by nature, as we all have probably experienced on many occasions in our lives, we're forgetful creatures. We forget things, you know, over and over again. Things that you think are profound and important, we wouldn't forget, we do. And God warns us over and over again, especially in this chapter and all throughout the Bible, really, of, you know, the dangers of forgetting things, especially when he blesses you. Because that's really when it seems to be easiest to forget things, especially things of God, is when you're, you're succeeding, maybe physically or financially, and God's blessing you. Which obviously there's nothing wrong with those things, but though that's the time when you need to be most on guard that you don't forget you know, the things of God. And all throughout the Old Testament, God is commanding his people to not forget and to remember the great things that he did for them. I mean, especially this story, I mean, the, the passing of the Red Sea. I mean, he just did some amazing things and he's continuing to do amazing things for his people. And in the New Testament, Jesus commands his disciples repeatedly to remember his words and teachings and even on several occasions harshly rebukes people, disciples and not disciples, for forgetting things or for not knowing things that they should have known. Um, and, you know, it is vital that we as Christians don't forget the many important truths. There's obviously many important truths in the Bible that we should remember. But I'm going to, you know, focus on a few tonight that I think are crucial and because I, I want to help us to not forget these important truths. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. The first truth that I want to really drive home that we make sure that we don't forget is, the, you know, is, is I don't want you to forget about your salvation. Now, some might think, well, what are you talking about, brother? I'm not going to forget my salvation. You know, and, and really maybe another way to put it is that you don't take for granted your salvation because it's, you know, that it's the thing with it being eternally secure and it was so easy to get. It's easy for us to take for granted our salvation. But, you know, that's why it's good to remind ourselves and to dwell on the things that, you know, are, that make up our salvation. Right there, in, uh, you're in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. But I'm going to read from Ecclesiastes chapter 7. You know, first we've got to remember that, hey, we're sinners. You know, a big part of our salvation is that we're sinners. And Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20 says, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. You know, and that, that always applies. You know, and that always applies to all of us, even if we're saved. You know, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And, you know, the reason why I take you to that verse is because, especially when you're saved and you're living for God, you know, and you're, 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 you're on the right path and you're mostly doing the right things, it's easy to get this puffed up attitude, you know, either in your heart or even openly thinking, oh, man, you know, I'm a pretty good person. I'm pretty, I'm pretty stellar because I'm not, you know, you know, I'm saved, I'm in church, I'm reading my Bible, I'm doing the things I'm supposed to be doing. It's easy to get this puffed up attitude and forget, you know, truly how sinful and wicked we are. I'm not going to re-preach the sermon we heard a few weeks ago, but I mean, the Bible says we are desperately wicked. Even as a saved believer, you are still desperately wicked. And yeah, your good might, you know... You know, you might be walking in the spirit more than you're walking in the flesh, but that flesh is still there, just as capable as anyone else's flesh, any unsaved person's flesh. So turn with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. Revelation chapter 21, very familiar verse. 
You know, and, and what you need to remember is you need to remember about your salvation what you deserve. Despite the fact that you're saved, you still deserve this punishment. In Revelation 21.8, all too familiar verse, but let's read it together. Look down at your Bible. It says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, obviously, when you're saved, you're washed free of all those things. In God's eyes, you are sinless because you are washed in the blood of Christ. You know, we are made righteous. Not, you know, we are, his, his righteousness, Christ's righteousness is imputed unto us. So obviously, when he, when he looks at us, he doesn't see any of these sins. But the fact still remains that we are still all of these things, or at least most of these things, at least liars. And so we need, to, we need to have a humble attitude and remember the fact that even though we're saved, even if we are living for God, we are still the same sinner that God said. You know, before we were saved, we're still the same person, although we may be living a godly life, and, and hopefully that's where you're at. You know, if you would, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. You know, another key aspect of, of remembering your salvation and a thing to remember about your salvation is that, you know, you... I'm sorry, I, well, just go to Isaiah 53. But the point that I really want to drive home about that last point, you know, it's just... If you really just stop and think about, we're all sinners. You know, we, yeah, we're on our way to heaven, we're sealed. But we, right now, at this very moment, every single person in this room deserves to go to hell. So just remember that. Let that sink in. If you, re you read the verses about how horrible hell is, Isaiah 53 really becomes all the more sweeter when we see that our Savior himself went to hell for us. Isaiah chapter 53, let me turn there. The verse that I want to focus on is, is verse number 10. Isaiah 53, 10. Isaiah 53, 10. We don't have to read the whole chapter, although it's all basically about Christ's suffering. But it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. You know, and obviously the context of the verse is talking about Jesus, you know, dying on the cross and being beaten for our, our sins and all that. But his soul, I mean, it goes more specific. His soul was made an offering for sin. Just like our soul, if we died in our sins, would go to hell. It wouldn't be an offering, it would be a punishment. But his soul was made an offering for sin. And we know that Jesus went to hell, of course. Verses like Matthew chapter 12 makes it very clear. It says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So just remember that about your salvation, that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, he was the perfect Lamb of God. He was without sin. He took your sins upon himself and spent three days and three nights in hell. Burning. I mean, you read all the descriptions of people that went to hell. You know, there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's outer darkness. I mean, it, it's just, you know, it's you're tor he was tormented by that flame. I mean, if you really just think about that, the fact that you deserve that, you know, it should, it should be something to keep you humble and keep you grateful for your salvation. The salvation that we have that Jesus paid for by going there himself. So let me get caught up in my notes. You know, turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. The, no, the next major truth that I want to make sure that we don't forget is that we don't forget the salvation of others, right? First thing we should make sure we don't forget is our own salvation. Obviously, we don't forget that we're saved, but the details of our salvation, if we don't dwell on them and, 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 and keep in touch with them, we might lose our gratitude and appreciation for our salvation. The next point is to don't forget the salvation of others. You know, Romans chapter 10, uh, you're, you turn to Romans chapter 10, I'm going to read out of Mark chapter 16. You know, we need to remember our commission. It says in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, and Jesus said, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, those are powerful words. You know, how Jesus is transferring this responsibility to his disciples and to all of us uh, by them. You know, and remember 
that your ministry, you Christian, if you are in this room and you're saved, your ministry is the ministry of reconciliation. Let me read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, therefore, in verse 17, it says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And it committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead to be reconciled to God. So remember that Jesus has entrusted you. I mean, I'm talking to every person in this room that's saved. He has entrusted you with the word of reconciliation, which is what men need to be saved from hell. I mean, the weight of that responsibility should definitely, you know, it should, it should resonate with you in your mind. Like, that's a big deal. I mean, there is no greater responsibility that you will have in your entire life. You have been literally given the keys to the kingdom. And remember that the only way people get saved is if someone preaches the gospel. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for as I say it, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 22. But what I really want to emphasize is the Bible makes it very clear the process by some, which someone gets saved. Some people might have some unique claims about how they got saved, but I go with the Bible and believe that no matter what you say, I believe that you heard somebody preach the gospel. Is ultimately what it comes down to. Meaning... You know, it even it asks it in a series of questions. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? Us. How will they hear unless somebody preaches it to them? You know, whether that's a saved person. You know, if, you know, I think you can listen to a recording of somebody preaching the gospel. Obviously, I've known many people get saved. I believe people in this room have gotten saved that way. But the point is that somebody preached the gospel to you. But, you know, that more often... You're, when it really comes to it, when the rubber meets the road, most people that you're going to meet in heaven are going to have been saved because somebody spoke to them face to face or just one on one preaching the gospel to them. You know, and if if we don't preach the gospel, I mean that that is another heavy truth that should sink in. We are not Calvinists. We do not believe in Calvinism that people that are you know God's going to save, who He's going to save, and you know whether we do anything or not, God's going to make sure somebody goes to that person that they would have believed the gospel. You know. Uh, a cold, hard truth that we have to accept. And it's hard to swallow and even, and, and even embrace this idea, but it's what the Bible teaches. If we don't preach the gospel, people won't get saved. You know, and obviously there are many believers in this world that can preach the gospel, but there are people right now that are burning in hell because somebody didn't preach the gospel. You know, you and I, we're all comfortable sitting in our chairs. You know, knowing we're on our way to heaven because somebody preached the gospel to us. Thank God that person did what they did. I mean, thank God. You know, I mean, it, it, it's terrifying to think about if that person had been lazy or whatever. You know, and just to park it here for a moment. You know, well, let's read this verse real quick and then I'll make that point. It says in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 24. It says, Son of man, say unto her. Thou art the land that is not cleansed nor rained upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane, neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves, ravening the prey to shed blood, and to destroy souls, 
to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have dogged with them, have dogged them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity, and dividing lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. You know, so it lists all these wicked sins that the, the nation of Israel was in. That's really what this is. It's talking about how wicked they are. And then it says, so, I mean, if you really read that list to yourself a little bit later, I mean, that's a horrible list of sins. And yet, God wanted to show these people mercy. Look what it says. It says, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before, the land, before me for the land that I should not destroy it. Or one of the saddest statements in the Bible. But I found none. Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord. I mean, there are so many applications to this verse, like if you really just think about it. There are just so many ways you can think about this verse. But the thing is, is that God wanted to show these people mercy. God wants to be merciful to people. But his ways are above our ways, of course, and he requires that a man stand in the gap. And we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. He expects us to stand in the gap and to preach the gospel to people. And there are people that died and went to hell today. I mean, maybe I can't say this with absolute certainty that they didn't hear the gospel but chances are somebody died today without hearing the gospel ever, and somebody could have preached them the gospel. And God could have showed them mercy. He wanted to. You know, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yet people died and went to hell today because some lazy Christian, I don't know if it was in Jacksonville or anywhere in the world, but let's just talk about Jacksonville because we know a big problem that people in Jacksonville have. I've met so many Christians on Sunday going out soul winning. They're sitting on their fat butts watching football or sneaking, having a cookout or drinking beer in their backyard. They're saved just as much as you and I are. They, you know, they know the gospel, yet they're too selfish and too lazy to go out and preach the gospel to people. And people are dying and going to hell because of that. And they're totally, they couldn't care less. They literally couldn't care less. And, you know, there are people in churches like ours who have excuses. You know, there are, I mean, our churches are very big. We've been at some churches that are obviously soul winning churches. But even at those churches, like that church in Tempe, you know, army of soul winners, there were still plenty of people that never went soul winning. And I don't care what your excuse is. You know, you say, well, brother, you know, I'm a mother and I have a lot of kids to take care of. You know, I know, I don't know what it's like to be a mother. I know it's hard to be a mother. But, you know, and some people might say, well, you know, I have this reason. I might have this physical ailment. I, it, it hurts me. I have this job that, you know, I have to work this much to pay my bills. You know, and, and you know, people can make excuses that in our minds, yeah, that seems like a good excuse. You know, I don't know what it's like to be in every situation that everybody's in. But one thing I do know is that if you're saved and you don't go soul winning, you have no excuse. And there's going to come a day where you're going to see the people that you could have gotten saved, that I could have gotten saved, but chose not to preach the gospel. And we're going to see them go to hell. And all of your excuses are going to be stupid. And we're going to regret. not. I mean, the regret is the scariest thing to me as a saved believer that I'm going to experience on that day. You know, the regret of not getting all the people saved that I could have or that I should have. You know, like, brother, like, like Pastor, you know, made that imaginary pie chart talking about this is all the people that you should have gotten saved. He said all the work that you could have done. Let's think it. This pie chart represents all the people who I put you in their life. I made it so you were going to cross paths with them. I made it so that you, I knew your personality and their personality would click. And nobody else's personality at that time in their life at that place would have clicked like yours would. And yet you chose to not speak. Let's say you saw them, you just didn't give the gospel. Or you just chose to stay at home and not go soul winning for blank the reason. Whatever the reason is, good or bad. I mean, there's really no good reason to not go soul winning, to be quite honest. I mean, ever. I mean, not, not that you got to go every single day, but good night. I mean, once, twice a week is there really so much to ask. You know, 
And we're going to realize that people, we could have got saved when he had saved. So, I, I, you know, words escape me to really kind of emphasize that. Because I, mean, I know the regret that I feel just in times I can think of where I should have given some of the gospel and I didn't too. And there are people that spend their entire lives not getting anyone saved. And they could have gotten thousands of people saved. You know, so let's move on. Uh, that's not the point of the entire sermon, but that's an important point to remember. Is that it's so easy to be saved and to be prosperous and to just forget about others. When the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. You didn't want to go to hell. You are directly disobeying the second greatest commandment by not preaching the gospel to people. Because you don't love them as much as you love yourself. But let's go on to the next point. So... Turn with me back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, and then also get Malachi chapter 4 in your other hand. De so Deuteronomy 8, Malachi 4. The next point that I want to make is really the point that the Bible makes the biggest deal about not forgetting specifically, and that's the law of God. Don't forget the law of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, where we first read, I mean, that, that's really what it's specifically about. And over and over again, you know, it's, it, it's talking about the law and commandments and all that. But, but really, I mean, the word of God is the law of God. So anything that's in the word of God, you know, you can take, you can rest assured you're not supposed to forget it. You know, but specifically the law of God is what he really emphasizes. So um, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 1. Here, you know, here are the commandments not to forget, just to refresh your memory. It says, all the commandments in verse 1, which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. So right there it says you have to observe to do it. And that, that you have to remember them to be able to do that. And let's get down to verse number 18. It says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. And remembering the Lord means to remember his commandments. Because if you forget his commandments, you've forgotten the Lord. Because... What the Lord wants you to do most is to keep his commandments, because that is how you remember it. You love it. So Malachi chapter 4, I mean, there are many verses I could have gone to, but these are, you know, just a couple that I feel like really cut to the chase. But Malachi chapter 4, if you have that in the other hand, verse 4 says, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto you in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. You know, I mean, that's a very broad, sweeping statement. I mean, specifically, it's talking about, obviously, the first, the, the, the books of Moses, which in and of themselves, there's a lot of content there. But it's a broad, sweeping statement. It's the entire, the Word of God. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 4. And you want to remember the laws, the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments. I mean, he gets real specific. It, if, you, if you were confused about what he meant, he breaks it down in several ways. But turn to Proverbs chapter 4. And so, um, you know, one thing we have to remember, too, with the law and the word of God, you know, is the Bible says that wisdom is the principal thing and that it is obtained by the law or by the word of God, right? Wisdom is the principal thing. What does that mean? It means wisdom is the most important thing. Like if you were to put value on things in your life and prioritize them, wisdom is right at the top because wisdom benefits every other area of your life. And it makes you pleasing in the sight of God. Roman, or, uh, Proverbs chapter 4, starting in verse number 1, it says, Hear ye children the instruction of a father. James, go get me some water. Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline, neither decline, where am I at? Neither decline from the words of my mouth, forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee, love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing, Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. So it's kind of a mouthful, right? But the Bible makes it very clear, you know, that wisdom is the most important thing you can seek after, and that is through the commandments of your father. If you keep the commandments, you're wise. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter, I think it was 8. Uh, somewhere in the book of Deuteronomy, it talks about how when the, the Israelites were going to keep the commandments, 
you know, the nations of the world were to look at them, it's like, wow, look at this wise and understanding people, you know, who keep these righteous commandments. You know, I'm paraphrasing that verse. But, you know, it's, it's obviously talking about from uh, uh, King Solomon to his son, but obviously the application is spiritual as well, where it's talking about God, our Father, and his commandments. So, you know, mercy and blessing will flow from the Lord. If we remember and do his commandments. I mean, if you want to please God, if you want to have a prosperous life, you know, even if it's not necessarily a financial prosperity, but just success in life in a godly way, and even in a physical way, a financial way, that also could come. You know, if that's the way that God chooses to bless you, you know, is you know, is to keep his commandments. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. While you're turning to Deuteronomy chapter 28, talking about the mercy of the Lord, I'll read from Psalm chapter 103, verse 17. It says, But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. So, the point is, is keep the commandments. God will show you mercy. And it's real common sense. That's what Deuteronomy chapter 28, it, the entire chapter is about. You know, it, it's talking about the blessings if you obey and the curses if you disobey. And if, you, if you're familiar with Deuteronomy chapter 28, the curses if you disobey are like two or three times as long. But the blessings are real pointed and concise. And they're amazing blessings in and of themselves. Deuteronomy chapter 28, in verse number one, it says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day. <clears throat> Excuse me. That the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way, and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses, and in all that thou settest thine hand unto. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee in holy people unto himself, as he hath sworn unto thee. If thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, and walk in his ways. And all people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the works of thy hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do. And I mean, who wouldn't want all those? I mean, who wouldn't want those blessings on your life? To be blessed with the fruit of your body, with many children. To be blessed with the fruit of the fields. To be, I mean, just to be blessed in every way possible. You know, how do you get that? By keeping his commandments. You know, it's amazing because one of the commandments says, you know, to not love money. The love of money is the root of all evil. So if you abstain from covetousness and abstain from the love of money and you keep the commandments of God, it's interesting how those things will end up coming to you. If those are not what your heart is set on, I think that's really what it's coming down to. You know, but so but we also have to remember what will happen if we fail to keep the commandments. Because that, you know, was just the blessings for obeying. And I don't know if I'll read all this, because if you're familiar with Deuteronomy chapter 28, it's very long. But I want everybody to pay attention. Because the Lord does not go on and on for 50 or 40 some verses for no reason. This is a very important part of scripture that, you know, we need to really take heed to and remember this. So starting in verse number 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice 
of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke, and all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do, until thou be destroyed. And until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings whereby thou hast forsaken me. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee. Until they have consumed thee from off the land, whither thou goest to possess it. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption, and with a fever, and with an inflammation, and with an extreme burning. And with the sword, and with blasting, and with mildew. And they shall pursue thee until thou perish. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass. And the earth that is under thee shall be iron. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. And shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. And thy carcass shall be meat unto all the fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the earth. And no man shall pray them away. The Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt, and with the emeralds, and with the scab, and with the itch, wherefore, wherefore thou canst not be healed. The Lord shall smite thee with madness, and blindness, and astonishment of heart. And thou shalt grope at noonday, as the blind gropeth in darkness. And thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. Thou shalt betroth the wife, and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build a house. And thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant the vineyard, and shalt not gather the grapes thereof. Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass shall be violently taken away from, from before thy face, and shall not be restored to thee. Thy sheep shall be given unto thine enemies, and thou shalt not have, and thou shalt have none to rescue them. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look. And fail with longing for them all the day long. And there shall be no might in thine hand. The fruit of thy land and all thy labor shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up. And thou shalt be wholly oppressed and crushed always, so that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. The Lord, the Lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore botch that cannot be healed. From the sole of thy foot unto the top of thy head. The Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thy, thou nor thy fathers have known, and there thou shalt serve other gods. So I, so I don't know if I would go on and on and on because it is a seriously long passage. But let's see if there's any, really just any points in here that I want to point out. I mean, it's, just, it's all bad is really what it comes down to. And, uh, you know, it kind of made me think of a saying, you know, it's, it's, if you obey the commandments of the Lord, you know, the Bible says, if the Lord be for us, who can be against us? Well, I've heard somebody very wisely say as well, it's true on the other hand as well. If the Lord be against you, who can be for you? I mean, you read this list of curses. And we need to, you know, obviously we need to have the right understanding. You know, some people want to say, oh, these, you know, you know, these don't apply to us. It's like, look, friend. The Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. These same blessings and cursings that were given to the nation of Israel and promised to them, if they obeyed or disobeyed, they're universally applicable. You know, we live in that, you know, this nation of prosperity where everything just goes well. And I mean, we have jobs, we can feed our families, we have nice homes. We have, I mean, we have, we have all that one could ask of. Even the poorest of people in the United States have, you know, luxuries that people in the world have never experienced. And yet, we need to realize that the Lord can and will take those away. And I mean, really the scariest things to me that I personally think about, you know, being so wrong with God, is, you know, losing my wife and children. I mean, and to think that the Lord would be the one taking them away from me, or at least allowing them to be taken away from me. I mean, that terrifies me. You know, so the point that really I think is summed up in all of this is that don't forget the law of God. 
Don't forget to keep his commandments, no matter how wealthy or how comfortable you are. Ever. And we're going to get into some into some tips that the Bible gives us to remember these things. They're pretty simple. It's a pretty simple sermon. It's nothing complicated, but it's still usually the most important things in the Bible are not very complicated. But let's move on. We're, we're almost done. So, you know, we just read through Deuteronomy 28. So turn with me, if you will, to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. So the, the three things that I've said we shouldn't forget so far is don't forget your salvation. Don't take for granted your salvation. Don't forget the salvation of others. And don't forget that people need you, Christian. People need you to preach the gospel to them. And don't forget the law of God, which is really an all-encompassing thing right there. But I mean, I, it, This sermon, would, it wouldn't be a, a faithful sermon if I didn't emphasize the point. That's really what the Bible emphasizes the most, is keeping the law of God. And, you know, words fail me to, to really emphasize that point enough. But... Uh, the fourth point that I want to also emphasize and make sure we don't forget is don't forget the judgments. Don't forget the judgment. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 is where you turn. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, it says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good or whether it be evil. You know, so we've, all, we've discussed the judgment that we'll receive in this life, right? If we fail to keep the commandments, if we fail to remember the things that God commands us to do. We also have to remember, you know, the final judgment. Because that's the judgment that, I mean, is the most serious, I think. Obviously, the physical judgments we can experience in this life are serious. But the most important judgment we need to always have at the front of our mind is the one where we all stand before Jesus. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You know, so the point really with all of this is to remember that one day you're going to stand before God. One day I'm going to stand before God. And I think we hear this enough in our church, not enough, but we hear this more in our church than I think I've ever heard in any other church. But, you know, especially just the lame, you know, you know just churches that aren't preaching the Bible. I mean, it, this is an important truth that if, if Christians heard this and really understood this truth, that one day they're going to have to give an account for their lives. And that they're going to have, I mean, there are so many things that are going to happen that day that if we all kept them in our minds, they would help us to stay on the right path. And, 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 you know, my goal personally is to have as little regret as possible because I've already failed at a lot of things in my life. I've already failed to do a lot of things that I should have done. You know, 30 years old, Lord willing, I've got 30 or 40 years left at best. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that I, you know, live that long. But I've already got enough regrets. I'm trying to minimize the number of regrets that I have because there's going to be a lot of weeping. Though. That's why God has to wipe away our tears that day. So just remember that, that, you know, obviously it's going to be a great day. You know, to see the Lord, you know, you've probably seen him before then, but it's going to be a, a terrible day. The Bible calls it the great and terrible day of the Lord. You know, that I may be misquoting that verse for, you know, that's talking about the, the day of the Lord when he casts his judgment. But ultimately, that will also be a great and terrible day. When we stand before God and he judges us, he divides the sheep from the goats, the goats from the lambs, and casts the unsaved into hell, and then the saved get judged for their life. And we have to stand before that austere man, which is our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and give an account for our lives. So the point is, remember that life is short and you will be judged for everything you do or fail to do. I'm going to repeat that. Remember that life is short and you'll be judged for everything you do and everything you fail to do. God doesn't forget anything. And we're going to remember everything on that day, too. So just remember that. And, you know, now just in conclusion, you know, here are some, you know, what the Bible says, how to remember the things you need to remember. You know, because that's really the key is how do we, we, we know that we're forgetful creatures. We know that we have a lot of things to remember. I mean, these are, I mean, I, I felt like this was a very basic, you know, not a very deep. Uh, examination of all the things that we, I mean, obviously it, it takes a lifetime to know this book, but 
it's an overview just to kind of give you an idea like, hey, it's important to focus on remembering these things. So how do we remember these things? How to remember the things you need to remember. Turn to Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15. The Lord gave the, the nation of Israel a means to remember all these things, specifically the law. But Numbers chapter 15, verse number 37, you know, this is what the Lord commanded Moses to tell the children of Israel to do so they would not forget the law of God. It says in verse 37, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe that you may look upon it, and remember all the commandments of the Lord, and do them. And that you seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you used to go a whore. That you, that you may remember and do all my commandments, and be holy unto your God. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, to be your God. I am the Lord your God. So, with that, I really think the key to remembering, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6 while I'm saying this. The key to remembering the things that we need to remember are repetition and reminders. Repetition and reminders. In this verse, you know, the Lord has given them a reminder, which is a re repetitive reminder. Because every time they put on their garment, they're supposed to see the ribbon of blue and think, keep the commandments. That's the whole point of it. And so, you know, obviously I believe that, you know, that's not for us. We don't have to walk around, you know, like these Hebrew Israelites with their not blue fringes. You know, these dirty fringes that they put on it, you know, they... You know, the, the Judaizers want to try to do all that, and they, you know, they mess up the one specific detail the Bible gives about it being blue. But, you know, we're not supposed to do that, but the Bible does give us other, you know, commandments about how we're supposed to make sure we don't forget the, the laws and all that. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. The Bible reads, verse number 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land, whither you go to possess it. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and all his commandments, which I commanded, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that you may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thine house, and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not. And houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells dig which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So, really, the key that I want to focus on when it comes to remembering these things is first, if you look, uh, point your attention to. Verse number six, it says, And these words which I command you this day shall be in thy heart. So the first key, or really, before you even put it in your heart, you have to read it. So, you know, that should go without saying. The first way to remember the Bible is to read the Bible. You have to get it in your head. The second key to remembering the, Bible, remembering the commandments of God is to memorize them. That's how they're in your heart. They're in you. To the point where even if you don't have the Bible, you can remember the scriptures. And then the third thing is to teach. Is to teach the Word of God. 
you know, specifically it's talking about to your children, but I think really a, a, an even more general application is just always be talking about it. Because when you're always talking about something, you're always thinking about it. But especially when you're teaching it to someone, especially when you're teaching them to a child, you have to think about them and break them down in a way that a child can understand them. So it forces you to really deeply meditate on those things. And, you know, it specifically talks about, you know, putting it, you know, on your clothing and putting it on your walls, right? Like, we shouldn't put the Word of God in our house just because it looks nice, right? Because you get somebody that, you know, makes a, you know, I wasn't even thinking about this, but, you know, somebody can print out this really cool sticker for you and put it on your wall. It looks really nice. But it's so that you can read that. Reading it. If you read it over and over and over again, you'll remember it. I mean, I can quote that verse to you. Not that it's a hard verse by any means, but I can quote that to you because probably because I see it all the time. You know, and if you put it in your house, all over the place, you're going to see it everywhere you go. You know, so the Lord, I mean, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't just trying to give, you know, some really, you know, unconventional interior decorating to, you know, tips. He was, you know, telling you, look, this is how you don't forget it. You surround yourself with it. You talk about it. You think about it. You teach it to others. Because if you forget, Deuteronomy chapter 28, the second two-thirds of it is what you have in store. So, you know, just in closing, right? So don't forget your salvation. Don't forget the salvation of others. Don't forget the salvation, or I'm sorry, the law. And don't forget that one day you're going to have to give an account for your life. And just read Deuteronomy chapter 26. I think it's the most concise about how to remember the word of God. You know, yeah, we hear this kind of stuff. We have, we have a great preacher. We hear this kind of preaching a lot. But I feel like it's a basic sermon that can never be preached too much. And, you know, personally, I know it's something that I struggle with. It's just remembering to remember. You know, as simple as that sounds. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to preach behind this pulpit. I pray, Lord, that uh, my not-so-eloquent servant, Lord, would still sink home with people, that uh, it would uh, hit a chord, that we would always remember to not lose sight of uh, the things that matter and to remember those crucial truths that uh, will not only make us successful and prosperous, but will uh, help us to avoid a lot of heartache in life. I pray for those that are out of town, that you would help them to get back safely. I pray for all the people that are in this room. You would bless us all, help us to be safe this holiday season. And help us to have a spirit of gratitude for Thanksgiving and just all the time, Lord, for all the many things that you have blessed us with. And, uh, Lord, we can never thank you and praise you enough. In Jesus' name, amen.